Well, hey, good morning, church fam. Good to see you guys, and uh, glad to be back for another week of our Margin Sermon Series. Um, if you haven't been with us over the last uh, few weeks, we've been talking about how if we want to become the best version of ourselves, we need to create margin. We need to create room in our lives for God to move in our thoughts. We need to think a lot about God. We need to give ourselves some time to think about God. Um, our lives are so busy and so cluttered that we find ourselves running in every different direction other than to the cross. And uh, as, a, as a symptom of that, we feel disconnected from God. We don't feel as close with Him as what we should because we often don't take intentional time to make room for God to work in our lives. So we need to create time to think about the Lord. But we also need to create room in our mind for theology. We have a lot of different beliefs um, that we grew up with or that our culture shares. And some of those beliefs are true. And some of those beliefs are false. And so we need to turn to God's word and to sound philosophy and to objective truth to come to a better understanding of who this God that we serve uh, and that we follow actually is. Not our false conception of God, not a misconstrued conception of God, but a biblically sound version uh, and reflection of the God that we discover in the Bible. And that image of God has been manipulated and twisted both by the church, but also by secular culture, and even by our own painful experiences. Um, in my childhood, I grew up, and my relationship with my father and my relationship with my church formed this view of God that was actually false and not true. And as I grow and learn and discover, even up until this day, I'm still trying to get a better understanding of who God is. So we need to make room for God to work in our theology. We also need to make room uh, for God to work in our temper and our anger. And so we've, we've talked about how we can make room for God in our lives. And today, you've probably heard this sermon many times, and if you've been in the church any time at all, you've heard it over and over again probably, but we need to make room for God to work in our talents. So if this is your first time here, welcome to our sermon series, welcome to our church family. We are really glad that you decided to hang out with us today, and we would love to get to know you a little bit better. If you'll just take a few moments to fill out the connection card on the chair in front of you, and you can also scan the QR code on the chair in front of you, and take that to our welcome center after service. We have a gift that we will give you as our way of saying thanks for being here. We're really glad that you're hanging out with us today, and uh, you can check out our YouTube channel to catch up on the sermons if you want to get a little bit more information about the sermon series that we've been in. If you have your Bibles, we are going to turn uh, to the book of Matthew chapter 25, and that's where we're going to be this morning. Matthew is writing his gospel and his reflection and his experience about his interaction with Jesus, the things that he did, the things that were said about him, the things that he taught, and Matthew actually used the other gospels as well, like Mark, for instance, in order to establish his narrative, but he was able to bring his own perspective from his own eyewitness testimony and his own experience. And he's talking about Jesus in this passage of scripture, and Jesus is specifically addressing his apostles. And he's going to instruct them about some very serious things. He had just got done exploring the grounds of Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 24. And he told them, he says, look at these stones. He's pointing to this huge temple, which isn't there anymore. He says, look at these stones. And he tells his disciples, who were Jewish men, he said, there will not be one stone left upon another. And they were shocked. I mean, that would be like me telling you, I want to let you know something. Within your lifetime, the White House will be no more. You will not even be able to travel down to Washington, D.C., and you will not see the White House. That's just a, a little glimpse. To them, it would probably be like D.C. will be completely wiped off of the face of the map. And depend, depending on your political you know, perspective, that might be a good thing. But, you know, it's never a good thing. There's a lot of history down there. I actually really do enjoy going down to D.C. It's probably one of my favorite things to do, um, you know, on the weekend or with my wife Angel or with the kids. I love the history. It's uh, valuable, important to me, and the memorial. Memorials, and it's something that I do treasure and hold very valuable. But that would, that would be a similar saying. Imagine Washington, D.C., and all of our history, and all of the things that we value as citizens being gone. And so the disciples were like, uh, okay, well, what will be the signs of the end of the world? Because to them, that was the end of the world. And Jesus gives them warning signs. He says, look, if you're pregnant, you're not going to want to be around when this happens. If it's wintertime, pray that it doesn't happen in wintertime. He's not talking about the end of the world in Matthew chapter 24 at first. 
He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in 70 AD. And so what a lot of people make the mistake doing is they take the initial passage of Matthew chapter 24 and they project it into the distant future to refer to the second coming, and that's not what it's referring to at all. I do believe Jesus talks about the second coming within this framework, but the initial passages of Scripture are dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem. And he's telling the disciples this for a very, very important reason, because he's going to send them to the entire world and to Jerusalem, and this temple that they are uh, so accustomed to worshiping at and valuing is no longer going to serve as the center of the God that they worship. God isn't going to dwell inside of this temple. In fact, Jesus personalizes it, and he views himself as the one who destroys the temple because they crucified him on the cross. And it's a really fascinating piece of history. If you like history, if you want to look more into this, look up the destruction of Jerusalem. Look at the account of Josephus. He's a Jewish historian which documented this. And you'll be able to see how he details this. Jesus goes on to say, where you see the eagles surrounding, there will be the vultures also. And he talks about how the Roman army is going to come and destroy the nation of Jerusalem. And that's exactly what happened in 70 AD. It was in 30 AD that the Jews cried out, to Pilate when they were going to crucify Jesus. Let his blood be on us and on our children. And two generations later, 40 years, that very thing happened. Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans for their rebellious tactics. And there's no temple anymore. There's never been a temple. Jesus' prophecy in Matthew 24 still stands true today. It's never been rebuilt. And here's one of the reasons why. This isn't actually what I'm preaching on, but I love this historical part, if you can't tell. One of the reasons why no stone was left upon another is because when they destroyed the city of Jerusalem, the gold that was in the temple melted beneath the floors, and they had to remove each stone, which were huge stones, in order to get down into the gold underneath to receive their prize. And that's how and why that prophecy actually came true in Matthew 24, when it was predicted about 40 years actually before it happened. And so Jesus is sitting down with the disciples. He dropped this mega bomb on them that the Jerusalem temple would be destroyed, and he is going to commission them and send them out into the world and to Jerusalem with a very important clarification. You don't want to be in Jerusalem when these types of things go down. And it was, it was part of their perspective. And he actually says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, let the reader understand. They would actually read Matthew's gospel as Jerusalem was being destroyed as an assurance of their faith to continue their mission work to go out into the world. And then he tells the disciples this, and this is what we're going to deal with here in this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. He tells them this, I'm entrusting you with something very, very sacred and important. Some of you have a little bit of that which I'm entrusting you with. Some of you have some of that which I'm entrusting you with. And some of you have the most, like the apostle um, uh, Peter, for instance, or John. Some of you are ten talent men. Whatever you're entrusted with, I expect you to be responsible for. I expect you to be prepared and responsible because I will hold you accountable. It's a very serious conversation that he's having with the disciples. Last sermon series, in our DNA sermon series, we talked about extreme ownership and extreme responsibility. And we looked at how important it is as a person to live by the value of being responsible for who we are. But we're extending that principle this morning as we look at margin by creating room for God to work in what he's entrusted to us with our talents, our skills, our abilities. Now, I can remember, this is probably one of my earliest memories of when I was first entrusted with something. I was in kindergarten, and I had a teacher who, once a week, she would give like a canister to a kid in the classroom. And they got to take that canister home, and they were responsible for bringing it back with hiding something valuable that they had inside. It could be their favorite toy or whatever. And weeks had passed by, and I did not um, have a turn yet. And finally, it was my turn. I can't tell you. It's crazy. I was in the fifth grade, and I, I still have this memory. And so I take the canister home. And come Monday morning for school when we're supposed to do the, because she did it on Friday, to give you a chance to talk to your parents and bring your toy back, I could not find that canister to save my life. I felt sick to my stomach. 
I had to go to class. Obviously, it's time, like, it's time for me to bring my hidden toy that the other kids had to type, you know, try to guess what color is it, what shape is it, is it big or small? Um, and I, I was so sad and sickened. I had let everyone down because my teacher and my classmates entrusted this canister to me. I was supposed to bring it back, and I lost it. And she had to buy a new one. It, it, it was terrible. It's like a terrible memory for me as a kid. But I wish that that was the last and the worst memory of being irresponsible with things that have been entrusted to me. It's not. <laughs> maybe a nickname for me might be Forgetful Rick. You know what I'm saying? Like the keys that are entrusted to me, I somehow to lose or whatever. But like my mind just goes a thousand miles an hour constantly. And I'm just thinking and creating and dreaming and living off in this fantasy future that sometimes the things that are entrusted to me, like I forget about. There are times when I have driven home after work here at church and I'm supposed to get my kids and I've left without them. Like, it's like, I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to go back. It's not good news, folks. But has that ever happened to you? Like something that's been entrusted to you and you've been forgetful about? I think it's probably happened to most of us. But man, it's like, it's a terrible feeling, isn't it? Have you ever broken something that somebody let you have that was valuable to you? That's like one of my rules. I really try hard not to borrow stuff from people because nine times out of ten, they're not going to get it back the way that they gave it, all right? And that's the truth. So, like, I have really tried hard. Like, Toby, one of our elders, he's let me borrow his, um, his tile cutter. And, you know, at the end of it, I make sure I try to clean it up and make sure it was how, you know, he gave it to me. And it's probably still not because Toby is, like, a very particular. Everything's clean and in order and organized. Um, and so it's like, you know, I tried to give it back the way that he gave it to me. But it's true. And what Jesus is telling his disciples is, look, I'm entrusting this to you. It's the most special, valuable thing that I could ever give to you, is the great commission of sharing the gospel with the world. And I want you to be responsible for what you're able to do and what I'm giving to you. And so the main idea this morning is simply this. In anticipation of the Lord's return, be prepared and be productive. If we want to make room for God to work on our talents, we've got to give him time and open ourselves up with the opportunity to serve him. I think one of the greatest places you could start is right here at the church, to serve right here at the church with whatever talent God has given you. Maybe it's tech, maybe it's graphic design, maybe it's teaching and education, maybe it's helping, maybe God has gifted you with the spirit of encouragement to become a part of our hospitality and welcome team. I mean, I don't know everybody, and I don't know what exactly God has gifted you, but if you don't know how God has gifted you, I really want to encourage you. Check out our website, severnchristian.org. You'll see a button at the top of the screen called the Shape Test. And if your information is in our Planning Center system, you'll be able to take that shape analysis um, test where you could discover what your passions are, what your skills are, what your experience is, and your abilities. And you'll be able to get plugged in at our church as we move forward and begin to develop and create more roles. And if there isn't a role for you, we will make one so that you can use your ability and your skill and your talent for the glory of God. But if there is one thing that I know to absolutely be true, it is this. We are called to be prepared and be, product be productive with what God has entrusted to us. And so, first of all, the first thing that I want to say is this. With great power comes great responsibility. The Apostle Paul put it like this in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, first for the Jew and also for the Greek. There is one thing that God has entrusted to everybody in this room, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The question that I want to present to myself and to you this morning is, are we being prepared and are we being productive with that which God has entrusted to us? And so Jesus sits down with his disciples and he says this in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. He says again, here's, the, what, the, here's what God's kingdom is like. If you want to know what the church is like, this is what it's like. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. This man that's going on a long trip is Jesus. And the long trip that he's taken is the crucifixion and the ascension into heaven. And those who he is entrusting things to are directly in this context, his apostles, but by extension in principle, us. And it says in verse 15, he gave, this is what he did. He gave five silver bags to one, two silver bags to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in the proportion to their abilities, and then he left on his trip. And so these various bags of money represent something very clear, their ability and their responsibility with the gospel. Now, everybody has different ranges of ability. 
There are one talent people, there are two talent people, there are five talent people. Everyone's different. And God is not calling you to be me. And he's not calling me to be you. In fact, the body is not called to be one body part. That's how the body works. Everyone has a different function, and everyone functions according to its purpose. And people have asked, why isn't the church growing? Uh, Even though we are, by the grace of God, man, we hit back at COVID. I mean, we were down, obviously, we stopped meeting, and then we were in the 60s, and then the 90s, and then the low 100s, and then the 150s, and then the low 160s, and then the 190s, and then the low 200s, and then back up to 230. I mean, we are slowly but steadily growing our church family again after being wrecked by COVID. And so this is a good part. A lot of people in our church are using what God has entrusted to them. But when people ask the question, why isn't the church growing? Well, it's probably because because parts of the body aren't functioning. That's, that's probably the issue, but here's the encouragement. God is never going to hold you responsible for that which you are incapable to do. That doesn't mean you don't grow or expand yourself or try to develop yourself and hone in on the skills and abilities that you have, but what that does mean is God is fair. God isn't going to expect you to do something that you can't do, and that's really, really good news. And so the portion is divided according to their ability. God isn't going to hold you accountable for something you don't have the ability to do. And so if you can do art, do it to the glory of God and help and love other people. If whatever it is that God has given you, be responsible with it. You see, it says Jesus left on a trip. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, but to each one of us, speaking as an apostle, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so Jesus gave us gifts. In Romans chapter 12, verse 6, Paul again put it like this. We have different gifts according to the grace that is given to us. And so here's the idea. If we love God and we love people with our talents, we will recognize our entrusted responsibility. God, you've given me the responsibility to serve you with how I am able, with my experience and my passion and my skills and my abilities. And I want to honor you. You see, when entrusted with responsibility, and with that responsibility will eventually come accountability. Accountability day comes. You've got to go to school in the fifth grade and bring back the treasure that you were supposed to bring back. You've got to give the tool back unless you're kind of like, you know, one of those guys. Or the book back for all of those of you who have borrowed the book and never returned it. But that's okay. Um, I've just bought another one and replaced it by now. But here's the deal. Whatever God has entrusted to you, there comes responsibility with accountability. It's what Jesus is telling um, his disciples. And I wish I could say that I have been totally responsible with everything that has been given to me or entrusted to me. There have been times where I have served as volunteers and I've totally dropped the ball as a volunteer. Maybe this has happened to you too. And when the accountability comes, nine times out of ten, what does the average normal person do? Uh, Okay, what do I do? I excuse my behavior by putting it off on my position. Well, I'm just a volunteer. You can't hold me accountable. Let me make something so very clear in the kingdom of God. There are zero volunteers. It might be a word that we use often. Hey, will you volunteer for this or sign up for that? But in in Jesus' perspective, there are no volunteers. There's no signing up for anything. There's no, hey, I'll I'll sign up to do this, but there's not going to be an accountability or responsibility And we try to do that as a church leadership and as ministry leaders, but at the end of the day, we're just representatives of the king. He's the one who holds us responsible for that which has been entrusted to us, not necessarily us as individuals, as his representative. And so the real issue is this. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to us. And when we stand before the throne and we can say to God, well, I was just a volunteer. I just, I was just a volunteer. I didn't own anything. This wasn't my business. I wasn't the preacher. I wasn't the elder. I wasn't the ministry leader. I just signed up for stuff. I was just a volunteer. Well, that's not going to work, as we'll see in this story. Look what it says in verse 16. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money, and he earned five more. Man, 100% gain. How many of you would like to see 100% gain on your investment? Yes, I would. That would be great. Well, look what also it says. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more, another 100% gain. He, some of us have a few thousand dollars to invest in our retirement. Some of us have several thousands of dollars to invest in our retirement. But the goal, nevertheless, is the same. It's to duplicate, is to earn. I mean, think about this. You get the great opportunity to take your money and give it to the bank who's going to loan it out to 25 people and earn 0.01 interest 
on your money. That's not, that's not a really good investment strategy, right? There is no way you'll be able to retire and provide for your future if you just put all your money in the bank. It's basically like burying it in the ground, is it not? It's like, oh great, I got like a fraction of a penny this month on my savings account. Absolutely not. There are other ways in order to get to, 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 to be blessed. And here's what I want to tell you. In two weeks, we're going to have a guest speaker, uh, Mr. David, who has a great financial background. We actually have other members in our congregation um, who have great finance backgrounds. They work for really great companies. They love God and treasure him with their money. And we would be happy to refer you. If you don't know really what to do with your money, we would be happy to refer you to Christian wonderful, godly people who can just help you decide and plan for your future. They would love to meet with you. But nevertheless, uh, David's going to come and he's going to preach about honoring God and making room and margin for him to work with our treasure. And then he's going to offer a finance workshop and he's going to give some basic skills and information and some groundwork um, for us to be able to love God and make room for him to work and with our money. But here's the illustration that Jesus is giving. He's giving us the opportunity, using the illustration of money investment, to love and serve him with what he's entrusted to us. And so Jesus is describing the action of the apostles and how they handle the word of God. That's what he's describing. That principle extends to us as Christians. It extends to us and how we handle the word of God directly, but also how we serve God with our talents, our skills, and our abilities. And here's the deal. The apostle Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, was an unskilled speaker you probably would not go to his church if, if he were preaching today, if you, if you didn't really know who he was. He stuttered, he wasn't powerful and persuasive in speech, but he had sound theology, he had sound philosophy, he was an intelligent and persuasive individual, but he wasn't one of those, you know, motivational speakers that you get up and you leave the church. He did not have the gift of encouragement or exhortation, which is the ability to persuade minds and hearts with how you preach and how you speak. But he was probably one of the most sound intellectuals ever known in the New Testament era, and he wrote all of that information down that we preach from today. It's incredible. He was entrusted with something, and he was responsible with it. Look what happens in this story in verse 19. After a long time, this is called, this is, this is the, um, uh, the second coming. After a long time, their master returned from the trip and called them to give an account for how they used whose money? His. How often do we think, my body, my choice? This body, we talked about temple. This is a body that God has entrusted to us that we are called to be responsible for, that I know I have failed many times with, punishing myself with food or lack of exercise or not getting enough rest. I mean, God has entrusted me with this body that I should honor him with. God has entrusted me with a job, with the ability to preach and, and to teach. I should be responsible with that. God has entrusted so much to me, my kids, my family, my house, this ministry, but these things are not mine. They are his, and that's something that Jesus is teaching his disciples. Look, this word of God that I'm giving to you is is not yours. This is mine that I'm entrusting to you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9, So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or the evil we have done in this earthly body. We will stand before the throne. And even though we are forgiven Christians, there will be a reckoning and accountability. And look, I don't know how Jesus is going to divide up the portion and the new heavens and the new earth and how people will rule and what people will do. There's a lot about heaven that we do know. There's a lot about heaven. When I say heaven, I'm talking about the new heavens and the new earth, the recreated universe out of the atoms that Jesus is going to destroy. I don't know what the different measurements will be, but it will be based on how you perform in his kingdom. You'll still be saved and present with the Lord, But whatever that's like, I believe is worth fighting for because I believe what the Bible teaches. I believe what the Bible teaches. I didn't believe that for the longest time. Like, no, you know, it's like, you know, kind of like communism. Everybody gets equal. Everything's divided up equally. Well, look, that's not what the Bible teaches. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 3. That's not what the Bible teaches. So even though I'm saved, I'm like, man, I don't mind just being the biggest loser in heaven as long as I get there, right? But I trust what the Bible teaches that whatever I'm working for will be worth it. And so I want to try to give it my best, not because I get a reward, but because I have a relationship with Jesus and he died on the cross for me, right? Amen. Isn't that the truth? And so if we love God and love people with our talents, we will welcome accountability. That's, I think that's what Jesus is saying. But when we love God 
and we accept responsibility with accountability, we will realize our productivity. I am most productive when I am held accountable. I really, really am. That's why people hire personal trainers and coaches. That's why people hire life coaches. That's why people create Facebook groups that they can have accountability with. That's why I believe Jesus set up this biblical structure in the kingdom where you have evangelists and ministers with elders, and it's this equal accountability and oversight of one another. An evangelist could come in and rebuke and remove a sinful elder. An elder could fire and remove an evangelist for teaching false doctrine. They were charged to guard, guide, and govern the flock. And so there's this equal governing ship in the Bible. I think it's a beautiful teaching, and it's something that a lot of churches don't follow, and a lot of ministers get themselves into trouble. Because usually you have like this one pastor system where one guy is in charge, is his church, and what he says goes, and it could be very toxic and very dangerous. I think, I think Jesus set the structure up through the inspiration of the Apostle Paul for a reason. But I have found for myself, and I think it's a biblical teaching, that when we are responsible and accountable, we will be most productive. Look what it says in verse 20. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver, so after the long journey, came forward. He's like, dude, look at this, man. Look, I doubled your investment. I mean, if you're a financial portfolio manager, how excited would you be to share with your client that you doubled their investment this year? That would be great. Or triple it. I mean, there are some people that make an insane amount of money in the stock market because they are so effective at it. But he came back, look, 100% gains in an ancient economy was unheard of. Uh, probably 100% gains today is not even close to reflecting what 100% gains would be like in, in the ancient times. I mean, we're talking about an incredible return. And he says, I was responsible. I am now accountable. Look what I did. And man, I don't know about you, but it really convicts me. Do I have the kind of attitude and spirit that I take what God has entrusted me with? Every Lord's Day, I come around the Lord's table when I'm saying, God, look at this. Look at who I talked to and who I shared with. Thank you for giving me lungs to breathe, eyes to see, ears to hear, a mouth to talk, a place to work, food to eat, life to share, because I've taken what you've given me this week, and I have honored you with it. That's the kind of attitude that this guy has. He comes forward, and he says, check this out, God. Look what I did for you. He says, I've earned five more. Verse 21 says, the master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. God wants to celebrate with us. He is not the kind of God that is like, man, I cannot wait to hold you accountable. Oh, you, you better wait till judgment day because I'm going to jot every single detail down and I'm going to say, well, what about this? You remember back on May 24th, 2016, when you were at the coffee shop and somebody was sitting in a corner alone, you saw them sad, and you felt that conviction to go, hey man, um, you mind if I buy you a cup of coffee? And you didn't, because I wanted you to create that opportunity to share the gospel, invite them to church, and have them welcome to part of my family. You remember, you, I gave you that opportunity, you didn't do it. That's number one. Number two, God's not like that. He's not the kind of jerk that's sitting up on the throne waiting for us to fail and rejoicing in it. He wants to celebrate with us. And God isn't the kind of guy that looks at Rick Bonifield at a missed opportunity and just shakes his head and says, another disappointment again. No, he's the kind of guy that says, hey, look, man, yeah, you messed up, but you got another opportunity. Tomorrow's a new day. Today is a new day. If you've been gifted with a spouse or kids or a home or a job, you have another opportunity. And God's the kind of guy that's going to come alongside of you and say, hey, look, let's celebrate together because I think that you can do it otherwise. I wouldn't have entrusted it to you in the first place. Remember, God doesn't hold us accountable for things that we are incapable of doing. He wants to celebrate us to become the best version of ourselves, and he will encourage us along the way. I really believe that's the accurate representation of who God is in Scripture. Verse 22, the servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. So he comes forward too, same story. Verse 23, the master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Doesn't it feel good to be recognized for your hard work? It does. A thank you, oh wow, this is, this is incredible, goes a long way. A master folder of laundry, a master cleaner of dishes, you know, I have found my biggest tension with my spouse is when I lose basic manners of appreciation. 
Isn't that the truth? Think about our kids. Why is it when they're so young, we cheer them on despite how they fail, but when they get older, we scorn them rather than cheerleading them? When they're young and they mess up, I'm like, oh, it's okay. You can try again. You can do this. That's why I tell Piper. Piper will go, she's five years old. She'll be like, I can't do it. I'm like, baby, no, you can do this. I believe in you. I think you can do this. Let me, let me help you. And when they get older, when we get older, we, we even talk to ourselves. We coach ourselves down rather than up. Why is that? I think we lose touch with who God is and what life is all about. God wants to celebrate with us. And there are so many times where we're not recognized for our, 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 hard, our hard work, but God recognizes it. Look, you may be at your job, and your master may be the worst. Your, your master is, what, is the biblical word. Your, your, your boss may be the worst. But the Bible teaches us that we work like we're working for the Lord, and he's a master who will give us the appreciation that he wants to give us and that we deserve in his eyes. That's a kingdom view of it. But so often, we look at our marriages and our family and our children and our jobs and our church, and we criticize rather than coach and encourage. Well, that's not the biblical way. But look, with responsibility and accountability comes productivity. And so we need to look at things like, how would God feel about this? Not how does my spouse feel? There are going to be times in marriage and with your spouses and families when you're not going to get the appreciation that you deserve. The ministers and the elders of the church won't recognize you like you think that you should and your heart's going to be broken, but if you can just shift that narrative to think, God, I'm doing this for you, and you're the only thing that matters, you will go through life much better. You'll never be disappointed, you'll never be let down, and everything else will be a bonus. That's a good kingdom mindset. Look what it says in verse four or 24. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant, gathering crops you didn't cultivate, and I was afraid I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. Here's what he's saying. This is, this is how I perceived you. Bad theology or flat out lying. Therefore, here was my action. I was unfaithful. I was irresponsible. I didn't make room for you to work in my life. And he's telling the disciples, look, if this is you, this is not good. So he comes back. He hides it in the ground. He puts it in a savings account to earn 0.01 interest on and he comes back and he says, here, at least I've given you your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. So he, he doesn't even get 0 .01. He gets nothing and he gives it back. Here's the deal. Here's what the master says. Even though this man lied to the master, he says, well, this is who you are. He says, even if this is what you believe to be true, you should have at least put it in the bank to earn interest on it. In other words, he's saying, you're lying. You're not being responsible. You're not being ethical. You're not telling the truth. You're making up excuses and pointing the blame on me and everyone else in your life, and you will never measure up to what your potential is because of what you think about me and yourself. That's what he's telling the wicked servant. You weren't responsible because you had bad intentions in serving me in the first place. And man, people come to Christ because they just want to get their sins forgiven or because they want to feel good about themselves or they just want to belong to a community. When that is a byproduct of the prime product, when we come to the master for the right reasons, that it's about a relationship with him and loving him for the cross, everything else will fall in line. When we go through life with a mindset, God You've entrusted this to me. I'm responsible to you. I'm accountable to you. I am recognized and productive for you. That is how we fall in line with the kingdom, and that is how we make room for God to work in our lives. If we want to become the best version of ourselves, the best thing that we can do is be extremely responsible with what God has entrusted to us, to have the right mindset about the kind of master that God is, and to be responsible and work hard, be productive with what he's given to us. We'll finish out with these last two verses. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. To those who use, what, uh, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have, will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now at first look, this looks like a salvation by works, right? He didn't do, therefore he was banished. 
It's not what it's, that's not what the Bible teaches. One scripture doesn't say all there is to know about one subject. A lot of people like to cherry pick, but you have to look at a subject and look at the entire total picture, what the Bible teaches about salvation. And here's what the Bible teaches. We are saved by grace through faith, not works. That's very, very clear. There is nothing we can do to merit, earn, gain salvation. There are necessary conditions that we must meet in order to accept God's salvation on the basis of his conditions like faith, repentance, baptism. But those are not things that we do because I have, have mental assent and trust in the name of Jesus and the person of Jesus and I've turned away from my sins and been baptized in Jesus' name. doesn't mean that I've done anything to earn salvation. It means I've met God's essential conditions in order to accept salvation on the basis of his commands. It's like me offering you $5 and saying, hey, whoever comes up and get it, it's yours, it's free. But if everybody just sits there and does nothing... You're never going to receive my free gift. It's the same way it is with salvation. And so many people just muddy the waters and mess it up uh, because of how they were raised or what they were taught by so-and-so. The Bible is very simple, very easy to understand. Here's the, here's the essential problem. Here's, here's the real issue. He was cast out into outer darkness, not because of his actions, but because of his faith. He didn't place faith in the right master, the right idea of the right master, he made excuses for his behavior. He was actually a wicked and evil person because he did nothing. He didn't even try. I think God would rather have us try and fail rather than to do nothing at all. Definitely believe that. And so how we live our lives is a reflection of what we believe and the kind of faith that we have. And we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, but our works determine the kind of faith that we have. James says that in James chapter 2, verse 24, he says, see, you are not saved by faith alone, but by works. What does he mean by that? You are not saved by faith alone in the sense that your faith isn't real if you don't have works that accompany it. And so it's a, it's a gut check. If I don't have works that accompany my faith, why? Where's my faith at? Where's my walk with God at? And that's my encouragement to you as you take the Lord's Supper over these, over these next few minutes. As you break that bread, which is Jesus' body, and you take that cup, which is Jesus' blood, I really want to encourage you, reflect on that. Reflect on your relationship with Jesus. It's not about what you've done this week, how you've messed up, or how you've succeeded. This is about the forgiveness of sins that Jesus gave you on the cross, that you, you accepted on the basis of faith. And ask yourselves the question, God, am I being responsible with what you've entrusted to me? with the forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and talents and abilities to serve you. My encouragement to you is to trust in him and to be productive and to follow him the way that he believes that you can. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for this morning and for the love and care that you've given to us. And Lord, we, um, we know, I know that I have messed up so much in my life every single day. Uh, I just, I don't live to my greatest potential, and I know I have grace for that, Lord, but I and we as a church, we want to honor you. We want to love you, and as we take this bread, which is your body, and this cup, which is your blood, we remember the sacrifice that Jesus gave on the cross, how he was extremely responsible and extremely accountable to you, and then the end of the story is that he was so productive because he earned our forgiveness on the cross. Thank you for Jesus and the life that he lived and the model that he set. Thank you for loving us through our weaknesses and our failures and our years sometimes, God, of disappointment and letdowns. And Lord, I pray that we'll be able to live life honoring you and loving you and giving you the best of what you have given to us. We love you, Father. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.